Uh, I want to take a few minutes and talk about leadership, the topic of the day. And uh, I want to tell you the, the title on the card that went out talked about sector smasher. Uh, because I have worked in government and education and business. And, and so I've got a perspective that uh, is not necessarily that common. And I hope I can share that. I hope particularly uh, if you have questions, we can probe that as we get into the discussion. But let me tell you what I can't do. Uh, because I have moved around sectors, I have not sat in a, in a particular role of leadership for you know, multiple decades. And one of the people we're very honored to have here is Don Lubbers. 32 years leading Grand Valley State University through different phases and different cycles. And that's a different kind of leadership where Earl Holton at Meyer, longtime president of Meyer, where, where, the, where the institution and the endeavor keeps changing. And you have to continue to tune your leadership, leadership style. I've been in institutions long enough that I've had to make changes and we've had to, to adjust. But, but there's a, that's, that's a perspective that I'll be able to offer across sectors, but, uh, but a little bit of a, of a, of a gap. I wish I, wish I could have stayed in many of these spots even longer. Uh, because there's some really richness in sticking with the same institution through different cycles. Uh, what I'm here to talk to you also about is leadership, not about uh, particularly about the role of a COO, a president, a CEO, a division director, or something like that. Uh, this is really about your leadership, and, and there, is, there are leadership opportunities every single day, every single situation you're faced. This can be in, a, in the nonprofit sector, the for-profit sector. It can be in volunteer work. It can be in your family life. It can be in your neighborhood. It can be anywhere. It can be in the classes. It can be in the class projects. There are certain characteristics about leadership. And, and typically what will happen is as you get the opportunity to exercise some leadership, you'll build some muscle around that leadership. And that leadership will ultimately uh, open up situations and pr pr presumably mostly unexpected situations where you can then apply the leadership again in a, in a new domain. So that's context and now let's talk a little bit about leadership. I want to start with one uh, basic premise. Uh, one of the typical questions is, you know, what, what book would you read? What's your favorite book? Those kind of things. Uh, Max Dupree, Leadership is an Art. Uh, and many of you have read it. It, uh, it really built out some of that vocabulary about servant leadership. Uh, I think this is a fundamental compass point in, in how to lead. Uh, that servant leadership at its most basic would be whatever that leadership opportunity is you have, it's really there to serve the endeavor. Uh, and and you, you, need, you need some ego to sit in a leadership spot no one's the perfect servant in those kind of settings, but it's a proper orientation. And I think that's a, a fair comment to make up front here because I'm going to talk about some other kind of character traits. And I, and I say those uh, knowing that in, for most of us, most days, uh, they're part reality and part aspirational. Uh, you know, nobody's the perfect servant. You know, nobody's the perfect you know, person of courage. Uh, and the fact that you're falling short uh, in that, or that you profess to hold that as a value, uh, pretty quickly leads to a charge of hypocrisy or uh, some other uh, terrible attribute, because you're not living all the way up to that. Well, you're not complete, you know, you're not as courageous, you say you value courage, but you're not being courageous right here. Don't be afraid of that. Uh, the, the other option is to set a very low bar and very low expectation for yourself and you, we really can keep growing in these, in these orientations of something like servant leadership. So let me talk a little bit about leadership across a variety of domains and what some of the common characteristics are. First one, I've never been given the opportunity to serve in a leadership situation if I didn't have some particular skill to bring to the table. My first job in state government, I was hired into the welfare office, uh, and I knew how to do some uh, economic modeling, uh, fairly complicated statistics, and I had a skill to transact. 
uh, you, you may be in a, in, a, in, a, in a student setting thinking about a nursing or an accounting or a physical therapy, or, but there's a, there's, a, there's a transactional element of ending up in, a, in an endeavor or it may be a skill you're going to apply entrepreneurially. You know, you know something about food service, you know something about cooking. I mean, you, you're going to bring a skill to the table in a transactional way, maybe communication, maybe writing. It doesn't have to be a you know, traditional licensed profession. But this question of bringing some skills to the table is very important. It's important that you build your skills. And you, and you will build your skills here toward a degree, but any of us who, who keep you know, engaging things and trying new things, we're always building our skills. We're always trying to learn new things. We're always seeing things we didn't know or didn't understand. We're, we're continuing to probe and question. So don't underestimate the fact that leadership, leadership's not, I'm gonna get my degree and then I'm gonna work on this leadership question. They're really united. I, you, you bring skills, that you solve things, you've got credentials, you've got standing, you've got a position, you've got something transactional that you're bringing. That typically is what gets you in the door and gives you the opportunity to interact and, and see how, how you can play in this domain, whatever domain we're talking about. Then what do you do? How do you really be transformational? Uh, when I would speak at some of the convocations, Lee's referenced one of them, I, I'd often say, you know, that, that first step onto the escalator, you had some skills to transact. That's how you got into the job. But if you really want to be transformational, let's talk about some of those other things. And I want to, I want to talk some about those. Second characteristic is what I will call, and it's one of the, one of the beauties of Grand Valley, has, has absolutely held, never flinched from the uh, admiration, esteem, and building around the traditional liberal arts. There are elements of an educated person in community life, in civic life, in organizational life that are absolutely essential. The traditional elements of a liberal education, a liberating education, if you want to, you want to get off a little bit of a charged word liberal these days, uh, but a liberating a traditional liberal arts education, what are some of those elements? An ability to communicate. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to speak. You have to have the, the organized thinking that precedes that writing and, and speaking. You absolutely will benefit if you're capable of understanding, empathizing, and engaging across group characteristics that aren't your own. You, you need, this is, there are, there are race issues, there's class issues, there's gender issues, there's gender identity issues, there's all kinds of places where we're the same but we're different. We need to live in our sameness and we need to live in our difference and we need to be able to engage, appreciate, understand, communicate, live, solve, help. And if you're not comfortable with the other, ultimately you're weak in your capacity to really be a, a problem solver. Uh, and that is a part of a traditional liberal education is perspective in other cultures, in history and other things. Another characteristic of traditional liberal education critical to leadership is what I call constructive skepticism. Questioning. Why do, why do we do things this way? Now, there is a domain of that, uh, which is a very well-exercised habit, that really is cynicism. I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than the next person. You know, they're all jerks. Why do they do it that way? You know, you know what that, that is. And cynicism's running rampant, and cynicism's killing us. We don't need any more. Put it away. But we do need a constructive skepticism, a constructive question. There's nothing that's good enough. Now, it doesn't mean you chase every rabbit, but there's nothing. We can always make things better. We can do better in business. We can do better in, in education. 
We can do better in every nonprofit. We can do better here right at the Croc Center. We can do better everywhere. And, and how are we going to do that? How are we going to question why and how and, and for whom we're doing these things? And then the last part of a traditional liberal education, again, communication, understanding of culture, study abroad so darn powerful for that, which Grand Valley's been a great leader in. The question of a, of a quest, of a, the, the, the process of questioning, opening up, dialogue, uh, review. And the last one I'll put in is, is just real knowledge and context. There's a lot of nonsense floating around in business, nonprofit, governmental sectors that a good basic knowledge of history, a good basic knowledge of statistics, a good set of facts will take the air out of their tires in a hurry. Uh, people are running off in various directions because they simply, they, they, nobody's challenging them on basic facts. Uh, and so it, you know, it really does matter that Afghanistan's not next to Australia. You know, Afghanistan's actually next to Pakistan. It, it helps to know that. You know, it's going to turn out. I mean, there's some there's some real basic knowledge that that will turn out to be quite powerful. It'll it'll let you focus on the real stuff and not be off chasing. So, specific skills to be in a position to lead, more traditional liberal arts skills to be even more capable of really engaging the question and the problem of the day. And now I want to talk about character. And this is where that gap between what you aspire to and who you really are will always show up, show up every morning when you look in the mirror, but don't stop aspiring for it. Because it's critically important we bring character. People are going to follow you when you're in a leadership situation. When you're in a group project and you've agreed to take something, they're going to follow you because you've, you've demonstrated competence to be the leader in that group setting. But also you seem to, I mean, you, you said you would do it, they trust you. You are trustworthy. There are certain character traits that you're demonstrating in those settings, and it's worth working on them because they themselves are muscles that need to be exercised and built over time. First one I want to talk about is courage. There's a lot of bad stuff going on. There's a lot of uh, cheat and lying going on inside organizations. Uh, there's a lot of disrespect and, and lack of respect, or lack of respect for human dignity in the workplace and in community settings. There's a lot of just a lot of bad stuff going on. And it's important when we see that, that we step up and do something about it. Now, you can't necessarily, we're going to get to another one here about judgment and other things. You can't necessarily fight every fight. But don't let the, the prudential judgment that we can't fight every fight cause you to use as an excuse not to fight any fight. And when you see that thing going on in the moment, there are two options. You can just kind of step back a little bit and hope somebody takes care of it. Well, that was bad. I hope that goes away. Hope somebody takes care of that. Gee, isn't there somebody in charge here? You know, could, we, could we find somebody? Or you can go ahead and step into it and say, well, you know, hold on, you know, could we just... And that's a little bit of courage. That's a, that's a pretty easy muscle to begin to exercise. Uh, I've been engaged, I've had the opportunity to be engaged in some fairly uh, contentious public policy issues over time. Uh, these get, they get very testy. There are people who feel very strongly. There are uh, threats made, there are lawsuits, there's all kinds of things. And it's important for me to have the courage to go ahead and step into things in some, some sense I'd really rather not be doing today. But I've been given the opportunity, I've got the responsibility associated with that opportunity to go ahead and make a difference. And I've, I've, got, to, I've got to have the courage. You've got to have the courage in an entrepreneurial sense to step into a market gap. People mortgage their houses to start their businesses. That's courage. It's a wonderful thing. It's a transformational thing. It's part of leading. But it takes some courage. And it's, it's a very important attribute. You're going to follow somebody who's demonstrating that. Second thing I'd put in is a basic, 
it's a, I'm going to call it a domain that kind of mixes a little bit of two. One of them is integrity, and one of them is sort of truthfulness, justice, fairness, right. Uh, and I, most of my life's been in big organizations. Big organizations, sometimes they get little clubs going on inside of them. You know, you, you, we sort of take care of our people, and we got our posse, and we, you know, we do our thing. That's not a, that's not a system of integrity. The system of integrity is we really are here about a common purpose. We're going to, we're going to tell each other the truth. We're going to have fairness. Everybody gets treated right. Everybody gets treated decently. I mean, there's just there's some basic elements there. People watching that, watching that in you when you are given this leadership opportunity, they're going to, they're going to be more inclined to follow you. They're going to give you the next grant of leadership authority if you seem to be someone of integrity, justice, fairness. Very important principle. Sometimes that takes some courage to have that kind of sense of fairness. A couple more, and these are uh, good old Aristotelian ones. Uh, Gleaves and I were talking at lunch. Uh, one of them, the old term for it is, is temperance. Uh, hold, hold your passions in check a little bit here. One of the current words that goes on, it's one of the ones I used in that convocation, is follow your passion. And that's a pretty common uh, uh, way of phrasing things these days. And there's an enormous amount of truth in it. Find something that lights you up. But the flip side is sometimes you can just go running after something, and your passionate commitment gets dialed a little too heavy. You're, you're off a little, a little far, a little rambunctious. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, if you, if you want to know the sort of the strict definition of temperance, you know, you can go back to the old temperance unions. I mean, it also means, you know, we're, we're really not, you're not going to end up being able to lead if you're, if you got, you know, alcohol, drug abuse kind of things going on. You may have that tendency, address it, you know, come to grips with it, deal with it. But it's, there, there's a lot of places where this plays out. It's very important organizations. You, you're looking at somebody that's got that kind of right right judgment, right balance. And the last thing, again, traditional term, I, I call basically a real sense of prudence, wisdom, judgment. And that comes back to some of your education. But these are the, these are the softer characteristics of leadership. They're really old, kind of old school, traditional things about having the courage and the, and the prudence to bring good, balanced judgment to the table and to hold, hold a group together except that there's some compromise, except that there's some balance, except there's still some things that are right and wrong. There's some boundaries on this swim lane we're not going across. But within that, we can, we can actually move forward with, with practical. That's a framework. So how do you actually do it? So we've now decided we're going you know, we're gonna, to we're gonna keep building our skills. We're going to have both sort of technical skills and, and in some sense more soft skills, communication, intercultural perspectives, ability to question the status quo, willingness to question the status quo. We're going to keep bringing some courage into this. We're going to, we're going to do what's right. We're going to take a few arrows because we're doing, committed to doing what's right. We're going, to, we're going to bring people together. We're going to bring good judgment to all this, all that. Now, what, what, sorry, a little sense, what are some of the mechanics? And here I want to talk about another second book that goes, it's on my reading list. So leadership as an art, servant leadership is one. Second one is something called leadership without easy answers. It's a book that came out of Harvard Business Press in the 90s. Uh, Ron Heifetz is the author. He's written a couple of the books on leadership. And he put out a basic framing of leadership in, in sort of the mechanics of it. And, and the first one is identify the adaptive change, he called it. What's the adaptive change? What's this organization need? What's this situation need? I'm bringing some analysis and judgment to this. It's really, what's the strategic choice? What's, what's the most important fundamental work we need to do here as a group? Identify that. Now, he, he immediately quotes another great thinker on leadership, Machiavelli. And he says, you know, there is no more delicate matter to take in hand, nor more dangerous to conduct, nor more doubtful of success than to step up as a leader in the introduction of change. 
For he who innovates will have for his enemies all those who are well off under the existing order of things and only lukewarm support in those who might be better off under the new. So once you identify what that change is, do a map. This is the key strategic change and do a map of whose ox you're about to gore, who's going to benefit, how much the people are going to benefit are going to work with you, and how much people whose oxes are about to be gored aren't going to, are going to work against you. And that's a, that's a prudential judgment. And you've got to, you've got to get, some, get some weighing and some, some tactical work. But identify. Second thing Ron Heifetz identify is, is regulate the distress. So we've now, we've all come together and we've said, we have been about this work and now we're going to change. We are, we are in a human services agency. We have always done adult services. We're going to add children's services because if we can't deal with the whole family, we can't really be as successful as we want to be in adult services. Uh, we're in retail. We need to add some service, some, some financial services. We've never done financial services, but if we don't add them, we can't. We, and, you know, every, every organization, we're going to try something new here. It's going to cause a lot of distress. Be very intentional about regulating the distress. Where are those pockets of people that have lived in the current status quo? These are the mechanics of getting that change through. Regulate that, help, help that distress. Get disciplined attention to the issues. Get capacity in place. If we're going to take on a new, get, get the resource, resource it. These things take money, they take talent, they take other things. Get the resources in place. You picked something fundamental and strategic. You figured out where it's going to cause the distress. You get the resources in place. Give the work to the people who are going to do the work. Don't keep the work at that leadership level. Get the work in the hands of the people who are going to do it. Protect them. Support them. Get it going. And the last thing is, and this has been one that has, I have benefited from almost countless times, listen for the voices of dissent. You're almost never going to get it entirely right. So you decide you're going to go off in a different domain. Somebody out there who's doing the work knows some foolish element of what just got handed down. And if you're not listening for it carefully, now some of that's just naysaying and hand wringing, but some of it's very, very worthwhile feedback and you have to keep your ear tuned and you have to keep coming back. One of the things that's most valuable to us, we do a survey at Meyer of our team members, essentially how things are going with some open-end comment, and we get some wonderfully valuable things back that really help us, help us uh, keep getting better. The, the last uh, piece I want to talk about in sort of a mechanics. So again, we've talked about some of the skills you need to bring, some of the sort of characteristics you want to build in yourself and bring to the table. Talked a little bit about the mechanics there. The second piece of mechanics that I've seen in many organizations is you will get what you measure. Uh, the current practice now in many organizations, let's get a dashboard up. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have clear measurements. Now remember, a dashboard looks backwards. So it's got a little bit of limitations on what can be on that dashboard in terms of real value for taking you forward. But I have seen this so many times with an organization getting what's measured. And the, the, one, the story I want to give you, it's a, a little bit long story. Humor me with this one. Uh, I started my, my professional life. Again, I told you I, I started working in the welfare agency. 14-story building, all kinds of people. I'm trying to do my job. I'm here doing some computer modeling. But you know, interesting people, interesting issues. So I'm trying to find out what all is going on around the organization. And it turns out we've all got an inbox, you know, this deep full of stuff coming through every day. And, but something must really matter here. What's, what's really, what really are we about here? Well, this was the late 70s, and there were uh, regular hearings in Washington about welfare payments being made to people who either were paying them more than they were eligible for, or we were paying it and they weren't eligible at all. And it was an error rate. And it would show up with these gaudy hearings about, you know, somebody's got their big fancy Cadillac, but they're on welfare, and isn't this terrible? And congressional hearings, and we'd be bringing agency people in, and public policy thinkers, and all the rest of it. 
So every time we'd have another hearing or we'd have another publication of the, of the welfare error rate, the building would shake. I mean, there'd be special meetings would be canceled, special meetings would occur, more staff for quality assurance. Well, it doesn't take long to figure out what matters here. They don't want errors. 1978. By 1990, we had a 30-page application to get on welfare. You had to come back in every month to redocument everything because we weren't going to have errors. We were getting a set of behaviors that exactly matched what we were measuring. You will get what you measure. If you measure graduation rates, you'll get higher graduation rates. There'll be a lot of steps that will go on, but if that is the measure that's up in bright lights, you'll get that. If you're measuring sales, we'll get more sales. Better watch margin. Better watch whether you're making any money on any of those sales. If we measure profitability only, big bright lights, better be careful. We might not be selling anything. You know, we're only selling the things that people are making a lot. You got to be careful with what you measure, but you will. Organizations will get what they measure. And you, you'll, you'll find this across all domains, all times. The other one, I, simple one, that I, I was treasurer of the state of Michigan. I had been with the the governor a different role back uh, when, when the uh, income tax refunds were coming out quite late. Michigan's got a much simpler income tax than the federal income tax. Federal income tax returns would come back faster. The, the, the uh, uh, payment back, refund would come back sooner from the feds than the state. He didn't like that. He said, well, get those done. Let's set a date of June 1st to get those done. We did, measure, big bright lights. We got it. We were getting all the refunds done by June 1st, no problem whatsoever. I became treasurer, I went in to go look at the schedule of all the events, and one of the things we came across was the, right starting January 1st was the correspondence hiatus. So what's the correspondence hiatus? Well, the correspondence hiatus was everybody who normally answers letters gets to work on processing refunds until we get all the refunds out the door. We're putting resources to what we're measuring. So if you got a letter, you weren't getting, you were nobody there to answer your letters, because we'd set that one measure up in bright lights and we got it fixed. And little small examples, but every organization's like this. You, you will get what you measure. Let me wind it back up to the broader questions of leadership and then I'd be happy to uh, take comments, questions, challenges, whatever's on your mind. Uh, and that is, uh, I've got a, a set of things that I believe I've learned about leadership, about bringing skills to the table, about certain personal characteristics. I have to keep tuning up my courage. I have to keep making sure I'm a person of integrity. I've got to keep doing those kind of things. I've got to make sure I've got kind of an analytic frame when I go into a problem. You know, who's going to be affected? Who's going to be hurt? Who's going to be benefited? Who's doing the work? Am I getting the resources? There's a, there's a set of mechanics to get this done. But that's my formula. There's certain elements I think are fundamentally true across all situations. I think there's lots of books on leadership. Most important is absolutely be authentic in your own leadership style. One of the beauties of leadership is people do it differently. Some people are quieter leaders. Some people are more vocal leaders. Some people are more analytic leaders. Some people are more passionate leaders. And, and it's one where it's useful to look in the mirror, to do a little assessment, talk with people, get some sense of, of what your style is. Probably worth tuning in a little bit. There may be a gap or a weakness in there. But most important, don't be sitting around second guessing yourself. Be yourself, be authentic, be fundamentally who you are because the authenticity is one of those characteristics of leadership. Everybody can tell a phony. Everybody can tell somebody it's kind of getting seized up because they're not sure which way to go because they're kind of over-processing. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a just go ahead and be authentic in your, own, in your own person, in your own style, and watch the authenticity of those around you. I had a chance uh, with, uh, a little bit earlier, I, I said, you know, I, I have had an opportunity to do things for which you know, years ago I absolutely, I just wasn't qualified for. But it's not just that people gave me a chance, but that the experiences I have had have actually built who I am. I, I have become a different person because I have faced so many challenges. I have, I have been able to build up probably more courage than I initially would have had 
because I've been tested along the way. Watch the people around you. The most valuable group of people for help, we're, we're, you know, weren't Ronnie Heifetz with Leadership Without Easy Answers or Max Dupree, Leadership is an Art. The most helpful people are a bunch of people named you know, Doug and Patty and John and Noble and other people who I had a chance to work with who had some faith in me, but most of all, or equally maybe, I was also watching them. I watched how they did this. What did they bring to the table? How did they engage? How did they face the challenge? How did they proceed forward with confidence even when they weren't confident? Uh, how, did, how did they proceed forward to really dig in and probe and not just take the, the first simple explanation, but really, really question what was going on? And, and you will find in every setting people that really are transformational, spend every minute you can with them, watching them, and, and, and diagnosing a little bit what is it that's going on there that makes it work for them so well. We've got a long list of challenges. We've got a broad ranging set of community and economic distress. Uh, we've got a political system that is really not performing very well for the common good. We've got some profound uh, structural uh, hardship raining down on, on, on the marginalized, the immigrants, the young. Uh, there's just a lot of tough stuff out there right now. And you're going to fix it. <laughs> we're going to fix it, actually. We're all still in the game. But we're, we're, we, you know, who's, who's going to do that? Well, that's a little bit like that part we talked about with the courage, you know? Well, gee, isn't there somebody in charge around here? Isn't there somebody else here who's going to take care of that problem? Isn't there somebody else who's going to have us live up to our organizational promise even more deeply? Well, the first, first place to look is in the mirror. What, what do I get to do? What, what can I do to make this better, make it... And I'm so thankful that you have signed up for the Cook Leadership. I'm so thankful the Cook Leadership is here to, to, to talk about this, to give it a vocabulary, to give some, some practice and experience in this. And uh, I look forward to continued engagement with you, and I look forward to uh, reading literature to hear all your successes, which we've already seen some from, your, from the preceding classes. So with that, I'll be happy to take comments, critiques, or questions.